In the early years of the 21st century, space agencies in Europe and America embarked on ambitious plans to land humans on Mars. The concept of manned missions to the Red Planet had been considered before, with Mars being viewed as a potential key to humanity's future in space. However, a debate ensued, questioning the feasibility of exploring Mars due to its distance, potential dangers and high costs. In a world facing numerous challenges, some began to question the necessity and will for human space exploration. More than three decades after the last Apollo astronaut set foot on the moon, the American manned space program appeared to be adrift, unable to extend its reach beyond low Earth orbit. NASA acknowledged the problem, stating that it had been essentially circling in the same trajectory for the past 30 years. Dr. Robert Zubrin, an astronautical engineer, emerged as a vocal proponent of sending humans to Mars, asserting that it was the crucial mission the space program needed. He argued that Mars represented the logical next step, presenting a challenge that had been staring humanity in the face for three decades. Mars being the planet most similar to Earth offered the necessary resources to sustain life and, potentially, a technological civilization. Zubrin contended that exploring Mars could provide answers to fundamental questions about life's prevalence in the universe and whether humanity could become a spacefaring species. Zubrin's involvement in Mars exploration dates back to the early 1990s when he led the Mars Direct program at Martin Marietta Astronautics. His team developed a mission to Mars that aimed to significantly reduce costs by utilizing existing technology. While Zubrin acknowledged that humans were not ready to go to Mars at that time due to challenges in ensuring their survival, he believed that the first steps on Martian soil could be achieved within a decade. Over the past 15 years, Zubrin and his colleagues waged a campaign to persuade society and policymakers that sending humans to Mars should be NASA's primary goal. The narrative unfolded as a story of the cold neighboring planet and the ongoing debate about whether the fate of humanity is intertwined with Mars. Zubrin's journey from advocating for Mars exploration to becoming the president of the Mars Society positioned him at the center of the discussion surrounding the future of manned spaceflight. The geopolitical landscape further complicated the picture, with other nations like China, Europe, and Russia expressing their intentions for space exploration. China, in particular, made significant strides putting its first Hakonaut in space and planning a manned program for moon exploration by 2017. The European Space Agency outlined plans for human missions to the moon by 2024 and Mars by 2033. In contrast, the American space program faced uncertainties marked by the retirement of the shuttle fleet, the completion of the International Space Station, and shifts in administration. The Bush administration, in 2004, announced the Constellation program with the aim of returning Americans to the moon by 2020. However, the program lacked full funding and was eventually canceled in 2010. The subsequent Obama administration proposed a vision for NASA and human Mars exploration by the mid-2030s. The shifting timelines and changing administrations raised doubts about the realization of such plans. Zubrin emphasized the urgency of a more ambitious and focused program drawing parallels with the success of the Apollo Moon program, which stepped the goal in 1961 and had astronauts on the moon eight years later. He highlighted the need for a timeline that ensures political success, asserting that a less ambitious program increases the risk of political failure. Reflecting on his childhood during the space race era, Zubrin expressed how the inspiring events of that time fueled his passion for space exploration. He stressed the importance of setting bold challenges that could inspire the youth, similar to how the Apollo program motivated a generation of scientists and engineers. Zubrin believed that pursuing human exploration of Mars could lead to the creation of intellectual capital and drive innovation in various industries. Despite the criticism of space programs for their high costs, Zubrin argued that exploring Mars was essential for humanity's positive future. He acknowledged the existing problems on Earth but emphasized the importance of thinking about the future and opening new chapters in human history. Zubrin believed that civilizations, like individuals, thrive when faced with challenges and decay without them. He saw the choice as one between growth and decay, 
urging humanity to choose growth. The historical context of President George H. L. Bush's space exploration initiative in 1989 revealed a similar attempt to push the boundaries of space exploration. However, the proposed program, known as the 90-Day Report, faced challenges due to its complexity and high cost estimates. Congress refused funding for the initiative, leading to its demise. Zubrin, at that time, critiqued the NASA plan and advocated for a more direct approach, launching a Mars mission from Earth's surface using existing rocket technology. Zubrin's vision for exploring and developing Mars as a new world clashed with the short-term flag and footprints approach proposed by NASA. He believed that Mars held the potential for sustaining life, and if evidence of a past warm and wet environment could be found, it might even provide clues about the prevalence of life in the universe. The debate over human exploration of Mars continued, with Zubrin remaining a prominent figure advocating for a more focused and ambitious approach. He saw Mars as the future of humanity, a place where new possibilities and discoveries awaited. The narrative underscored the critical choices facing humanity, whether to embrace the challenges of space exploration or risk stagnation and decay. As the story unfolded, the question of whether humanity would become a spacefaring species and inhabit more than one planet remained at the forefront. The uncertainties in timelines, political support, and funding painted a complex picture of the future of Mars exploration. Zubrin's passion for growth, exploration, and the positive impact on human civilization echoed throughout the narrative, challenging society to choose the path of growth and progress. In the grand tale of Mars exploration, the fate of mankind hung in the balance, awaiting the decision on whether to embark on the challenging journey to the Red Planet. In the pursuit of designing a cost-effective and feasible mission to Mars, Dr. Robert Zuprin and his colleagues at Martin Maria Astronautics proposed an innovative approach known as Mars Direct. This approach aimed to simplify the mission, make it more robust, and reduce costs by utilizing local resources and existing technology. The Scenario Development Team, a small group formed within Martin Marietta, explored alternative Mars mission plans. Zubrin and his collaborator, David Baker, focused on a near-term mission that could be launched directly from Earth, drawing inspiration from historical exploration expeditions like Lewis and Clark. Contrary to the skepticism of others who believed in the necessity of on-orbit assembly, Zubrin explored the idea of producing methane-oxygen rocket fuel directly from the Martian atmosphere. This concept aimed to reduce the weight of the launch ship, making it more manageable. The key breakthrough came when Zubrin proposed splitting the mission into two parts, sending the return vehicle with its own propellant plant to Mars ahead of the human crew. This ensured that the astronauts would find a fully fueled ship waiting for them on the Martian surface before they even left Earth. The resulting Mars Direct plant was deemed relatively inexpensive, had a short development time, utilized existing technology, and allowed for a prolonged stay on Mars. The Earth Return Vehicle, ERV, carried the necessary equipment for the return journey and deployed a small nuclear power reactor for producing methane-oxygen rocket fuel. Another ERV, launched a few weeks before the human crew, served as a precursor and potential backup to address the health effects of zero gravity during the six-month transit to Mars, the crew would deploy a weighted tether to create artificial gravity. Upon reaching Mars, the astronauts would embark on an extensive mission, conducting research, exploring the Martian surface, and potentially searching for signs of life. The success of their findings could provide insights into the possibility of colonization and answer the profound question of whether life exists beyond Earth. Zubrin and Baker presented the Mars Direct Plan to NASA, and initially, there was excitement and support within the agency. However, opposition began to emerge from groups threatened by the plan's minimal reliance on their programs, such as the space station teams and advanced propulsion groups. Ultimately, NASA rejected the Mars Direct proposal, leaving Zubrin and Baker as outsiders once again. Undeterred, Zubrin continued advocating for Mars exploration and in 1992, with a new administration at NASA led by Mike Griffin, there was renewed interest in Mars Direct. A successful experiment demonstrating the production of rocket fuel on Mars helped regain attention and support for the mission plan. 
Despite concerns about mass estimates and trip times, a compromise mission architecture was developed. The Mars Direct Plan, while facing challenges in opposition, demonstrated the potential for a more achievable and cost-effective approach to Mars exploration. The narrative highlighted the intricate details of the mission, the collaboration between Zubrin and Baker, and the dynamic interactions within NASA as they grappled with the vision of human exploration beyond Earth. NASA's testing phase before committing to a manned mission to Mars involved launching three ships in the third year, with the HAV occupied by astronauts. Two ships were reserved for a future mission unless needed as a backup for the crew. The first HAV on Mars could also be utilized by the team. Following a year and a half stay, the crew would rendezvous with the return ship, providing a roomier environment than Zubrin's ERV. This approach was named Mars Semi-Direct by Zubrin, while NASA referred to it as the Design Reference Mission. Despite having a larger crew and more significant equipment, the Design Reference Mission maintained the principles of Mars Direct. The cost analysis of the Design Reference Mission was significantly more favorable than the initial $450 billion estimate for a 90-day report. The mission was projected to cost $55 billion spread over 10 years, fitting within NASA's existing budget. The plan garnered widespread attention, even making the cover of Newsweek. However, despite the success of the design reference mission on paper, NASA's focus remained in low Earth orbit after the completion of the International Space Station and the retirement of the Space Shuttle program. A debate ensued within NASA about the future of space exploration. Some argued for a continued emphasis on low Earth orbit, developing technologies for the future, while others believed in setting a concrete goal akin to the Apollo program in the 1960s. The lack of a driving imperative and a singular program led to a sporadic set of constituency-driven projects, hindering NASA's productivity. Experts contended that NASA needed to be destination-driven, citing the productivity of the agency when it had a clear goal, such as the Apollo moon landings. The absence of a focused goal since 1973 was perceived as a stagnation of the American space program. The urgency to set a goal, specifically human exploration of Mars in the near term, was emphasized, acknowledging the once-in-a-generation opportunity to revitalize the space program. Dr. Zubrin expressed frustration with NASA's lack of achievement, attributing it to a lack of focus and a specific goal. He argued against the need for massive nuclear electric spaceships, emphasizing that the purpose of spaceships was to explore new worlds rather than linger in space for observational purposes. The disappointment and sense of betrayal among the American people regarding the absence of progress in space exploration were highlighted. The movement to send humans to Mars began in 1978 at the University of Colorado when a graduate student named Chris McKay explored the possibility of introducing life to Mars. This led to the formation of the Mars Society in 1998 with Robert Zubrin as its president. The society attracted members globally and organized conventions, contributing to the advocacy for human exploration of Mars. To advance the knowledge necessary for a manned Mars mission, the Mars Society established research stations worldwide, modeled after Zubrin's HAP module. These stations facilitated experiments and simulations under harsh conditions to understand the requirements for keeping a Mars crew alive and productive. The societal and historical significance of a human mission to Mars were underscored, emphasizing the need for a compelling vision to drive space exploration. The challenges and risks associated with sending humans to Mars were addressed, including radiation exposure from solar flares and cosmic rays. Zubrin proposed solutions like creating a central insulated core to serve as a storm shelter during solar flares. The psychological impact on the crew, potential cabin fever, and fears associated with space travel were acknowledged. Comparisons were drawn to historical expeditions with long durations, highlighting the resilience of past explorers. Despite concerns, the consensus was that the challenges of a human Mars mission could be overcome, and the benefits of exploration outweighed the risks. The psychological aspect of fear was considered normal for astronauts with the acknowledgement that it would be abnormal for someone not to experience fear before embarking on a space journey. The potential impact of a human Mars mission on shaping history and leaving a lasting legacy was emphasized, presenting a compelling argument for the pursuit of this ambitious goal.
The Mars Direct crew, supported by a global audience and promising life-changing rewards upon their return, will primarily reside in the two-story habitat, AB, meticulously designed for psychological well-being during the extended confinement. The galley slash wardroom area akin to Earth's homes will likely be the central communal space, offering chairs, a table, and an entertainment screen. Individual stata rooms, enabling communication with loved ones and colleagues on Earth, will be approximately four to five feet wide. Selecting and testing the Mars crew will be crucial to cope with a profound isolation, ensuring a well-balanced and supportive team capable of living together for two and a half years. The prospect of being part of a historic adventure, extending the reach of the human species, draws volunteers coast to coast, acknowledging the lasting impact they can leave. Despite the potential loneliness described by moon traveler John Young, the importance of a cohesive crew cannot be overstated. Addressing the back contamination concern, which suggests bringing Martian disease organisms to Earth, is considered baseless. Natural transfer of material from Mars to Earth occurs regularly, and the infinitesimally tiny probability of harmful Martian pathogens reaching Earth warrants thorough testing and protocols for a Mars crew. The first Mars landing, witnessed by millions on television, marks an unprecedented moment as humans set foot on a never-before-seen world. The crew's mission includes exploring ancient water flows to search for signs of microscopic life. Equipped with a pressurized rover, they can cover a vast area during their 18-month stay, examining Mars' diverse topography equivalent to all Earth continents combined. The ultimate question arises, will Mars host human settlements and become a new branch of civilization? As subsequent missions explore wider areas, an ideal base site will be chosen, likely with a thermal vent providing water and power. Multiple halves will be landed, interconnected, and a permanent human presence established, necessitating self-sufficiency. Despite challenges, Mars possesses the essentials for survival and development. The 24-hour and 37-minute day is conducive to plant growth, and Mars offers elements for building materials and abundant frozen water. Innovations will enable scientists to live off the land with the potential birth of the first true Martians and the gradual influx of settlers seeking new opportunities. Mars, envisioned as a lab and open frontier, prompts noble experiments in governance and societal structure. The planet's terraforming becomes a long-term goal, involving the warming of Mars and eventually making it habitable. Automated factories producing super greenhouse gases are proposed, raising temperatures and releasing carbon dioxide to thicken the atmosphere. The vision of transforming Mars into a green world, potentially supporting complex life forms, sparks a philosophical debate on human intervention in the universe. Some argue for preserving the natural state, while others view spreading life as Earth's gift to the cosmos. The debate extends to the methods and time frame of Mars terraforming, with expectations that fantastical 23rd century technologies will achieve the ambitious goal. At a crossroads, the decision to embark on a Mars mission stands as a courageous step toward exploration, innovation, and the potential for humanity's continued expansion. The alternative poses the risk of stagnation and decay. The exploration of our solar system and the prospect of expanding human life beyond its boundaries serve as vital elements for the continued existence of our civilization. Driven by our inherent nature as explorers, the eventual journey to the stars is inevitable. The timeline for a manned Mars mission remains uncertain, with optimistic estimates suggesting a possibility within 10 to 15 years while pessimistic perspectives extend the timeline to three or four more decades. Political considerations and economic challenges, compounded by the lengthy duration of the voyage, contribute to the uncertainty. The Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS, in Utah stands as a simulated environment for studying life and work conditions analogous to those on Mars. Assembled by the Mars Society, the MDRS comprises a habitat resembling a Martian spacecraft, a greenhouse, a wastewater recycling plant, and an observatory. Crews from various backgrounds, universities, science institutions, and space agencies worldwide spend two-week rotations at MDRS to gain insights into living on Mars. The Kiwi Mars 2012 mission, led by Commander Hara Mosanu, involves a diverse crew from New Zealand and Australia. 
The crew explores the challenges of coexistence among individuals from different backgrounds, anticipating that future Mars missions will similarly feature multicultural teams. The mission aims to contribute to humanity's understanding of Mars exploration and prepare for the eventual manned mission. While the technology for reaching Mars exists, obstacles like economic constraints and political will hinder immediate progress. The crew at MDRS focuses on maximizing the analog environment to learn and adapt to challenges, contributing to the collective knowledge required for a successful Mars mission. The MDRS experience serves as a valuable opportunity for the crew to immerse themselves in an alien environment, fostering collaboration and learning. Commander Haramosanu emphasizes the importance of multicultural crews in future Mars missions, mirroring the diverse nature of humanity. The crew, comprised of scientists, artists, educators, and weather experts, acknowledges the relevance of their experiences to various fields, from geology to art and education. The Mars mission serves as a unique adventure, pushing the boundaries of understanding confined spaces, extreme environments, and the implications for human survival. Health and safety officer Bruce Ney Arua faces an early medical emergency as crew member Annalie twists her ankle. Despite the setback, the crew underscores the significance of the learning curve, emphasizing that the experience at MDRS contributes to individual growth, societal understanding, and the broader knowledge base for humankind. The unforeseen challenges only reinforce the crew's commitment to the mission's educational and exploratory objectives. One of our crew members had an accident, falling on the stairs and possibly twisting her ankle. To rule out a fracture, we decided to drive almost 90 kilometers to the nearest x-ray clinic. While the incident turned out to be a sprain, it highlighted the challenges Mars crews will face, needing to handle injuries and illnesses with limited medical resources. The psychological aspect of living in close confinement is evident at the Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS, mirroring the conditions anticipated on Mars. The MDRS experience indicates that interpersonal dynamics and coping with personal habits in confined spaces will be crucial for Mars explorers. Living together in close quarters is not a new challenge, but on Mars it becomes more pronounced due to the limited ability to escape annoyances. Personal habits, noises, and tensions can escalate quickly. Even a brief outdoor stroll requires suiting up in a spacesuit, emphasizing the importance of managing conflicts within the habitat. During the MDRS mission, Tensions arise within the first two days, with disagreements over the enactment of a landing and arrival ceremony. Exhaustion and differing opinions on the necessity of cultural elements in the simulation create friction among crew members. The crew's ability to communicate openly about their feelings and concerns becomes crucial in resolving conflicts and preventing them from affecting the mission. The decision to abandon certain aspects of the arrival ceremony is made after considerable debate emphasizing the need for compromise and flexibility within the team. The crew recognizes the impact of fatigue, jet lag, and individual coping mechanisms on their interactions, leading to a constructive discussion about their experiences. The health and safety officer intervenes to ensure the well-being of the mission commander, highlighting the importance of prioritizing basic necessities over mission enthusiasm. The crew acknowledges the need for open communication and the resolution of interpersonal tensions to maintain a positive mission environment. Despite the challenges, the crew values the opportunity to learn from the experience and adapt to the unique conditions of living and working in a simulated Martian environment at MBRS. At this juncture, Hara has been active for more than 30 hours. However, Bruce discloses his own health condition, diabetes, to Hara only after everyone reaches the Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS. Out of concern for his well-being, Hara decides to restrict Bruce from driving the quad bikes or participating in field trips without full support. This introduces a new element to the expedition, but Hara believes it won't significantly alter the mission dynamics. Commanders on Mars, like on any field expedition, must handle emergencies, and even if some members can't join field activities, there will be essential tasks at the habitat, especially maintaining communication. The MDRS crew's daily routines involve both necessary tasks and specialized work, such as geology field trips. Similarly, 
Operational tasks on Mars will require crews to undertake regular activities to ensure the habitat functions efficiently. In the Utah desert, nothing is taken for granted and flight engineer Don Stu monitors fuel and water supplies daily. Water conservation is crucial as it is rationed even at the MDRS with limited showers and careful water usage. The Kiwi Mars crew learns about the significance of pumps essential for various functions like airflow, water transfer, equipment operation, airlocks, and waste disposal. A water pump failure prompts the crew to use traditional methods like siphoning, highlighting the importance of reliable equipment on Mars. Food poses another challenge in the simulated Martian environment with limited and dehydrated provisions. The cooking routine alternates between days, employing a just-add-water approach. Crews at the MDRS, including QE Mars, participate in a nutrition study by Cornell University for NASA, recording daily weight and completing surveys about their food consumption. One aspect real Martian explorers may not encounter is the intrusion of food supplies by desert mice. The Kiwi Mars crew discovers on the third day that mice have accessed the pantry, leading to the disposal of affected food stocks. To prevent future incidents, the crew stores rodent vulnerable food in sealed plastic bins. Despite these challenges, the crew acknowledges the importance of such experiences in preparing for potential issues during a Mars mission. Adjacent to the habitat lies a greenhouse that was initially constructed for recycling gray water and experimenting with cultivating various crops. Unfortunately, it has fallen into disrepair with the gray water recycling equipment unused and the greenhouse shelves void of plants. While future Mars missions might involve extracting ice for water from beneath the surface, efficient water recycling will be crucial during the long journey to the Red Planet, similar to the current practices on the International Space Station, ISS. Presently, the ISF recycles just over 75% of its water, indicating progress towards self-sufficiency. This research not only benefits space exploration, but also has potential applications on Earth. Despite the breathable atmosphere in the Utah desert, Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS, crews have the option to wear simulated spacesuits for extravehicular activities, EVAs, Future Mars astronauts will face challenges like extreme cold, an unbreathable atmosphere, and low air pressure, requiring advanced spacesuit designs. Concurrently with the Kiwi Mars mission, a group from the Austrian Space Forum tests a Mars suit prototype in Austria's Dachstein ice caves. At the MDRS, crew members wear overalls, boots, and backpacks with air circulation equipment for outdoor activities providing a glimpse into the conditions Martian explorers may encounter. The MDRS habitat features two non-pressurized and non-airtight airlocks. Although not functional, Hara instructs her crew to pretend they are waiting for decompression before going outside. Martian explorers will have three potential options for mobility. Walking, using a motorized buggy, or utilizing a pressurized rover for longer journeys without spacesuits. The MDRS crew has access to a mock pressurized rover, a four-wheel drive SUV, although wearing spacesuits inside is impractical. On Mars, rovers can significantly expedite exploration compared to current rover technology, allowing for more immediate and comprehensive geological investigations. All-terrain vehicles, such as quad bikes, serve as a practical solution for exploring the local environment at the Utah Station. However, on Mars, their range would be constrained by spacesuit air supply, and alternative power sources to petrol engines would be required. Human explorers on Mars could achieve in hours or days what currently takes rovers weeks or months. This physical interaction with the Martian environment, such as picking up rocks, would provide valuable knowledge beyond the capabilities of present rover technology. The Mission 118 crew, based in Utah, explores the desert landscape without spacesuits, focusing on understanding the geology of the catchment area and collecting gravel specimens. The Utah desert holds an abundance of fossils, offering insights into the region's geological history. A field of fossilized oyster shells, dating between 60 million and 160 million years old, indicates past water and marine life in what is now an arid desert. The distinct strata visible in the desert landscape represent different geological periods, 
providing clues about the environment and life millions of years ago. Fossils, particularly if found on Mars, could be a vital clue to previous life and a highly sought after geological discovery. NASA's approach to exploring Mars with rovers like Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity involves deciphering the history of Mars water through the examination of specific rocks and features formed in the presence of water, mirroring the activities of the Kiwi Mars crew in Utah. Evidence of past water activity is visible even along the observatory path near the habitat, with peculiar formations known as concretions. These spherical structures, resembling man-made objects, occur naturally, akin to the formation of pearls and oysters. Interestingly, similar blueberries were discovered on Mars by Opportunity's camera. Scientist John Russ from NASA Ames in California visits the Kiwi Mars crew halfway through their mission, sharing insights into the Mars Desert Research Station's geological features and their relevance to Mars exploration. The Utah landscape, while not replicating Mars' atmosphere, exhibits geological similarities such as inverted river channels and eroded boulders, providing valuable testing grounds for theories about potential Martian life, particularly within or beneath rocks. The crew's collection of rocks and fossils grows, including discoveries like fossilized shark's teeth, gypsum, and petrified wood, including a whole petrified tree trunk dating back millions of years. The Morrison Formation, a sedimentary layer, showcases a rich history of freshwater, seawater, desert, and plant influences. The crew's scientific endeavors highlight the intricate details visible at both macro and micro scales, emphasizing the uniformity of geological processes. In preparation for Martian exploration, considerations extend beyond scientific tasks to recreation, reflection, and the establishment of personal identities within the habitat and potentially on Mars. The key Mars expedition introduces mascots, Tupu the Kiwi and Kim the Kangaroo, symbolizing the respective countries involved. Additionally, the symbolic planting of a flag represents a cultural affirmation and identity, transcending the scientific pursuits of Martian explorers. Among the initial activities undertaken by Apollo astronauts on the moon and likely to be replicated on Mars is the symbolic planting of a flag. At the Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS, in Utah, a permanent flag displaying the red, green, and blue colors representing Mars with aspirations for terraforming and the creation of seas, lakes, and vegetation, stands atop the habitat. It symbolizes hope and ambition for the future. The Kiwi Mars crew, infused with their unique cultural identities, contributes to the symbolic landscape. Bruce Narua, drawing from his Maori heritage, paints and displays the Maori flag. Herva embraces her Romanian roots, while Don and Annalie, originally from Australia, introduce a meaningful touch by incorporating the Aboriginal flag into their display. This infusion of cultural elements reflects the diverse backgrounds of the crew members. Exploring artistic expression in the desert, flight engineer Don decides to turn the local soil into clay, envisioning potential artistic creations. And Lee, too, channels her creativity, working on drawings for an upcoming exhibition centered around the mission. The crew engages in artistic endeavors, transforming the mission's experiences into tangible expressions. Looking ahead to Mars exploration, the crew acknowledges the communication delays, reaching up to 20 minutes, due to the vast distance between Mars and Earth. Despite the frustration posed by the delay, the crew anticipates overcoming such challenges as they envision future human endeavors on the Red Planet. The Kiwi Mars mission continues its activities, embracing daily routines, field trips, and the captivating exploration of the desert landscape. As the mission's final day approaches, under Hera's guidance, the Mission 118 crew creates a ceremonial Mary compass using rocks on the ground. Symbolically, Hera and Bruce bury rocks from Red Rocks in Iron Bay, New Zealand, at the MDRS Solar Garden, representing curiosity and the Polynesian people's historical navigation by the stars. Reflecting on their two weeks at the Mars Desert Research Station, the crew contemplates the significance of the mission. The fossilized tree in Lai Canyon, the vibrant landscape, and the adaptation of life to the environment leave a lasting impression. 
Each crew member expresses their personal highlights and the rich learning experiences gained during their time at MDRS. For Bruce, the interaction with students and the opportunity to communicate live with them emerge as a particular joy. The geological wonders, such as Factory Butt, also stand out as remarkable symbols of the incredible Martian-like landscape surrounding the habitat. The crew expresses satisfaction with their ability to live, sleep, and work together harmoniously. On the final day, as the crew packs up, they carried back kilograms of geological samples, tangible evidence of their scientific endeavors. Addressing potential skepticism about the mission's impact, Ali emphasizes the successful research, EVAs, sample collection, and daily interactions with students, considering the mission accomplished. The Mars Desert Research Station is acknowledged for offering crews a unique opportunity for self-realization, potentially surpassing its contribution to humanity's quest for Mars. The simulation's authenticity is emphasized, regardless of the habitat's construction material. In the end, the mission's value is viewed through the lens of self-understanding, recognizing that a deeper understanding of ourselves prepares us better for the future.